Now, the Laserdisc wasn't without its shortcomings as well. The discs were heavy. They needed to be flipped over should you want to finish a movie because each side could only hold an hour. And, yes, you still needed to change discs should the film that you're watching exceed the two-hour limit. The players were very expensive. And worst of all, the discs suffered from a condition known as laser rot. This was a common problem with early laser discs, caused by oxidation in the aluminum reflective layer due to poor quality adhesive used to bond the two halves of the disc together. Results varied. Best case scenario, you would see slight specks or snow artifacts, or maybe slight distortions in the audio. But sometimes, the video can be rendered totally unplayable. You never knew when laser rot would strike, but it was inevitable, and was all the more reason the format remained in the shadows of cassette tape. Seeing the drawbacks of the new format prompted other companies to continue refinement of the older phonograph-style video systems, still believing it had some kind of chance in the great battle. RCA put an end to the development of Panasonic and Mitsubishi's entries into the competition, as well as a new flexible optical format offered by Thompson CSF in 1980, with the Selectivision brand Capacitance Electronic Disc, or CED. Introduced in 1981, the CED attempted to improve analog video disc technology with higher density grooves and a convenient delivery system. The 12-inch discs were constructed of PVC blended with carbon to allow conductivity, plus a thin layer of silicone lubricant added to the surface. They rested on a special caddy inside protective plastic cases, which could only be extracted upon insertion of the entire unit into the player. Improving on ideas researched during Telefunken's TED technology, in which users no longer needed to directly handle the disc. Selectivision only lasted a couple of years competing against Laserdisc, the most likely reason for its short lifespan being the video quality it had to offer. It was poor in comparison to even VHS, and degraded even quicker after only a few playbacks. The players had defects as well, requiring high maintenance, replacement of the stylus, and belts after a while, which became costly. The delivery system, on the other hand, was novel, and caught the attention of JVC in 1983, when they released their own slightly smaller version of the CED called the Video High Density, or VHD. These were almost identical in design, seeking attention primarily in Japan and Europe. The one major difference? It's a hybrid of optical and phonograph technologies. A stylus was required to read the data, but the disc lacked grooves. It was read electronically via the stylus, rather than with physical contact. The radical design still didn't catch on, leading to the format's demise in 1986. The Aerospace Corporation McDonnell Douglas had a hand in developing a format inspired by CED as well releasing laser film in 1984. These were made of photographic film for transmissive playback with focused laser technology, rather than reflective playback typical of Laserdisc. Commercial application was poorly marketed, but they did find use in McDonnell Douglas flight simulators for a while. Back in the front lines of the format war, Laserdisc still remained right behind the two main competitors. This time with a new line of discs that aimed to solve the laser rot problem using higher quality adhesives that reacted differently. The helium neon lasers used to read the discs were replaced by solid state lasers. Widescreen formats were experimented with, attempting to recreate the true theater experience within the confines of a boxy CRT screen. User interaction was further explored, with some discs finding use as demonstration tools, even video games. The discs allowed for pre-recorded footage 
to be inserted as cutscenes or to be fully integrated with the graphics of a game. The optical format also allowed for a high storage capacity of data, in which arcade cabinets began pushing the boundaries of 3D graphical environments. Laserdisc would eventually evolve into CD Video, or CDV, of 1987 with the advent of Compact Disc. These were gold-colored optical discs that were marketed towards the MTV generation as they could only hold five minutes of video and were therefore usually sold with the latest music videos included on them. This would later become Video CD, or VCD, and Movie CD in the 90s, both formats capable of being played on computer operating systems such as Windows 98 or Windows XP. They were also the first formats to store information digitally instead of analog. DVD would come to succeed with capacities up to 17 gigabytes, depending on the specific format, boasting superior video and sound quality, thus finally putting an end to the production of Laserdisc and VHS in the early 2000s. Holographic Versatile Disc, or HVD, was an attempt to increase the capacity of optical storage, but as this format was too expensive, it lost to the superior Blu-ray format introduced in 2003. Today, DVD and Blu-ray continue to compete, but are already faced with obsolete in the face of entirely digital media capable of being streamed straight from the internet. Who knows what will come of video media in the future, but one thing is for certain, it's a cycle of evolution that will continue for years to come. Well, it's been quite a journey. And you'd be surprised how many seemingly insignificant things in life have such a deep and rich history behind them. Even things such as video disc formats. It's one of those things we take for granted every day. Every time we plug in a DVD or we press play on a video we find on the internet, we forget what it took to get there. What it took to reach such a convenience in life. And to me, that's why history is so important, even with things such as this. History teaches us how to be better in life based on the trial and error and the successes of yesterday. So that tomorrow's generation is no longer burdened with the problems of yesterday. And that's why I tell people never throw away history because it's the key to a better future. I'm Ray the Retro Guy. See you next time.